Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, uh, I think what you've done is going to become legendary, and the person who follows you should not try to duplicate this. It's not good for your health to <laughs> constantly be in there. I cannot tell you how I am impressed with your personal energy and the engagement you've uh, offered on behalf of our country, and I really do appreciate it. I think we all are amazed at your work ethic. Uh, Iran, a couple of years ago, the young people took to the streets in Iran. They were met with a uh, very brutal response, and they were upset about the election, which I think most of us would agree was probably not free, fair, and transparent. Looking back, do you think we missed an opportunity there? You know, um, Senator, we, we spoke out at the time, and we were also um, not only conscious of, but advised by people from within and outside of Iran that it was very important for them not to be seen as though they were in any way um, a, a directed by, affiliated with the United States, that this needed to be viewed as an indigenous Iranian movement. Um, so I, I think we struck the right balance, but obviously what we have seen in uh, the uh, year and a half or so since um, is the brutality of the Iranian regime, its absolute uh, commitment to repressing uh, any kind of opposition. And I have been upping, certainly, you know, my rhetoric. Uh, we have, under the legislation passed by the Congress, the ability to designate human rights abusers. We've been using that very uh, dramatically. To, have we I think, designated good anybody in Iran as being a human rights abuser? Yes, sir, we have. We have designated a number of them. I just designated some more of them a few days ago. What's so, the highest official has been um, I think, um, I don't remember the, uh, I'll get you all of that. The prosecutor general was somebody we just designated. Would you consider Qaddafi a human rights abuser? I would consider uh, Qaddafi a human rights abuser, and I would consider the leadership of Iran a human rights, uh, as abusing human rights. Including the President Ahmadinejad? I, I think that there is uh, certainly evidence of that, yes, sir. Well, let's drill down to this. Uh, the idea of a no-fly zone probably is complicated, but it makes sense to me to make sure that the Libyan people will not have to face air power and that we have the ability to do that. I understand the concerns about just passing out weapons. You don't know who you're passing them out to. Would it be, uh, would it be smart if the, there was another uprising in Iran where the people took to the streets, that we stand behind the people uh, in the streets and impose a no-fly zone uh, in Iran if they used air power to oppress their own people, or is that a different situation? Well, Senator, I think that uh, I'm not going to speculate on a hypothetical. Okay, fair enough. Let's talk about oil. Uh, gas prices are going to go up to $4 a gallon. I think we're well on our way. Uh, are you familiar with the oil sands in Canada? Yes, sir. And the pipeline that's being proposed to be built from Canada to Texas, I think, Louisiana? Yes, sir. I've been told that the second largest known deposit of oil is in the oil sands in Canada and that it uh, is equal to or greater than Saudi Arabia and Iran, and uh, there's some problem with the pipeline. What's your view of the pipeline? Should America be trying to receive this oil from Canada? Well, Senator, since um, um, my department bears the uh, ultimate responsibility for making a recommendation on the pipeline, uh, I am not able at this time to express an opinion. Um, the, uh, Are you generally supportive of receiving more oil from Canada and less from the Mideast? I am generally supportive of receiving more oil from Canada. I am absolutely supportive of us doing more um, in energy efficiency and renewables and looking for uh, clean ways to use our own uh, resources as well. Well, let's go to war zones. Now, in Iraq, by the end of the year, according to the uh, agreement negotiated by the Bush administration, uh, all American troops are supposed to withdraw by 2011. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, come 2012, there's a lot still to be done in, in Iraq. And you will be the lead organization. Is that correct? That's right, sir. That is a major obligation. Yes, it Probably is. Probably never <laughs> undertaken in the history of the State Department. Uh, what would it take for you to safely and effectively do your job? Are you going to have to build a uh, State Department army to provide security? How do you get around? And uh, if the Iraqis ask for some American troops at their request to stay behind to provide force protection, uh, training, uh, intelligence gathering, logistical support, 
Would you believe it would be wise for us to agree to some level of troop presence in 2012? Well, Senator, first let me say it is unprecedented. Uh, we have been planning as uh, a State Department since the Bush administration. Uh, there was not only a, uh, an, a SOFA signed, but also a strategic uh, framework agreement signed. And in that, um, in the Bush administration, uh, we agreed with the Iraqi government that we would provide uh, a significant presence. We would uh, continue to provide support for police training and other functions. Are you worried about the safety of your people? If yes, you sir. Yes, sir. We and are I am worried. too. Uh, how many people worried. would you envision being in Iraq to do the jobs that you'll be tasked to do? I think uh, we're looking at thousands. I mean, like over 10,000. Over 10,000. And we've yes. got to realize as a committee, we're going to have 10,000 American citizens, all civilians, uh, trying to do business in Iraq all over the place with no troops. Well, in fact, we, we have a total of about 17,000 civilians, and the great uh, proportion of those will be private security contractors. And that is basically a private army replacing the American military. So I, I'd like us to think long and hard as a nation, does that make sense? You being in the lead makes perfect sense. Now let's move quickly to Afghanistan in 42 seconds. You're negotiating a strategic framework agreement with the Afghan government, is that correct? We call it a strategic partnership dialogue, but that's what it is. Okay. And the surge of military forces has an uh, equivalent civilian surge, is that correct? Yes, sir. And General Petraeus has told me, you and everyone else, he cannot win the fight in Afghanistan without you, USAID, Department of Agriculture, Department of Justice. Is that correct? That's right. Now, do you think it would be wise for this country if the Afghans made a request as part of this negotiation to have joint basing past 2014, where they request our presence, where there would be a uh, joint basing arrangement with American air power and special forces capability to ensure that we maintain the gains that we fought so hard as a signal to the region that America is not leaving this place in a helpless situation. What would be your view of well, such Senator, a request? It's, it's, it's not only the United States, but NATO at the Absolutely. Lisbon summit made a commitment that we will be supportive of uh, uh, the Afghans after 2014 when our combat mission ends. There are many ways to achieve that. We have ruled out permanent American bases, uh, but there can be other ways where we provide support for uh, the Afghans. Just as you referenced with the Iraqis, they have not asked us for anything, but they have huge gaps in their capacity and they are in a very dangerous neighborhood, so they may well come to ask. But that's a very different situation because then we have fulfilled our obligations, our combat troops have done their duty, uh, some to the greatest possible sacrifice, and now it is a nation asking for United States uh, continuing support. And that will be up to this Congress and this administration to evaluate.